Okay. Are you, you can ready? <clears throat> yeah, I can hear you. All right, here we go. We've got all uh, okay. the left. Hello, everyone. Hello. We're waiting for others. Yeah, let's give it one more minute. Or two, as people are. That sounds good to me. We've got John here. Hi, Dom. Hi, Celeste. Hi, Ala. Uh, Hello, is that Sheila Schoenbrunn, the soprano? Sheila, can you unmute yourself? Okay. okay. Hello, Sheila, is Sheila Schoenbrunn? Yeah. I saw you sing the Messiah at Queens College solos when you were pregnant. Oh, yeah. Right. And I was very pregnant. Yes, you were. I remember. I was there. Sang yeah. beautifully. Fortunately, <laughs> it was late enough so the baby dropped and I had breath. Unbelievable. That was what, 1970 or so? I am. What do you have there, Philip? Yeah, was... I'm sorry? What do I have for lunch? Oh, no. <laughs> no. Well, that too. And uh, it's the, this is our light meal of the day. I love it. Celeste, what do you have there? I couldn't see it. It's this is uh, turkey and chicken and ham and cheese, but very thin. Oh, nice. <laughs> no, so yeah, Sheila Shelbrun. I'm a Sheila. great fan. Oh, so look at that. Went back. And this is an album of, um, of Sheila with, um, oh gosh, a whole list of people, Lainu Davenport, you, you name it, the gang from, uh, from Pro Musica. And it was called, it's called uh, Music for a Medieval Day, my, my first early music album. And um, I followed Sheila when she was in the group music for a while. Yes, yes, I uh, all did, absolutely. And Sheila, I don't want to take too much time away from the lecture, but let me just say, Sheila, um, I studied, my, the biggest influence on my life as far as teachers, conducting teachers goes, was Paul Maynard who uh, started teaching at Queens College when I was going for my master's. Anyway, hello, Marsha, hello, Jane's iPhone, whoever that, that is, and Togu, welcome everybody, Elise. Let's start right in. Uh, do you have anything to say, um, Karina? Well, um, we have some new faces, so I'll go over my, my spiel. I know some of you could probably say it back to me, um, but we wanna welcome you to our session today, which is gonna go over um, St. Matthew's Passion, which is so exciting. Um, there will be a live Q&A at the end of the session that anyone can raise your hand. Harold will call on you and you can ask any question you have. Feel free to also ask questions as we go pertaining to things that Harold is talking about in the moment. But if you have any other questions about anything else or things that come up at the end, we will have save time um, in the last few minutes. Um, we do have everyone on mute to avoid any extra background noise or feedback. So to unmute yourself, um, you can hold down the space bar when you're talking. Releasing the space bar will automatically mute yourself again. And if that function doesn't work on your computer for any reason, you can use the microphone icon in the bottom left-hand corner of your computer. Beyond the Q&A, Harold has offered to be available at any time um, for any of your questions. Simply email Harold at his email, haroldrosenbaum at gmail.com, and he can set up a phone call or a Zoom meeting with you personally. We'll be sending over, well, actually I've already sent over some information about the organization and some more in information about Harold, including his book, to the chat box in this Zoom um, meeting. 
all of that information, there is also a donation link. If you would like to donate, all of donations are tax deductible and they go towards the organization that supports Harold's two New York based choirs. Um, we would be, any donations are greatly appreciated. Lastly, we'll be recording the session and archiving it and you will get a link sent to your email so that you can revisit the material at your leisure. Um, finally, we, we know we do have some more People, spots available in order to um, for for each of these sessions. So if you know anyone that would be interested, um, please tell them what we're doing. Harold is, uh, you know, donating his time, and we want to make sure as many people get access to this awesome opportunity as possible. So all of that being said, um, Harold, take it away. Okay, thank you. And I just want to mention I am giving a three-hour um, conducting slash score study workshop this Saturday. There is a charge for that. If, you're, if you don't have the information, you can email me. Uh, we're gonna spend most of the time discussing all six Bach motets. Um, okay, so I've conducted the same Matthew Passion twice. The first time with a quite an amateur chorus, but they did, they did very well. We made some cuts. And I believe if I remember correctly, it was members of the uh, orchestra of St. Luke's that I hired for that. And then the second time I did it was in Manhattan with my Canticum Novum singers, uh, which normally has about 24 people in it. But when I spread the word that I was doing the same Matthew Passion, um, the group doubled, more than doubled in size. We had, I think we had 58 people in it. You know, I auditioned very carefully as I always do. Um, and it was fantastic. And I just sent to, to Karina a link. If you go on YouTube and look at, and type in Rosenbaum, St. Matthew Passion, and scroll down, I think, to about the sixth or seventh one, you'll see me conducting the first movement. And uh, uh, for 19 years, up until last year, this organization had a youth choir. So we had our own youth choir, our professional choir, and, and a, a very, very good volunteer choir. And the, the youth choir is in this piece. They're in the first movement. And then they sit still for quite a while, and about, I don't know, 40 or 55 minutes later, they sing the final movement uh, with, with, the, uh, with the adults both times. And then they leave the stage and they just go home and, and not, unless they want to hang around and take a bow at the end. Um, so, uh, and that was with the, um, an orchestra assembled um, by uh, Meredith Bake, Meredith, I forget her last name. She's a flautist and she's a graduate of the Manhattan School of Music and she assembled recent Manhattan School of Music players and they were fantastic, really fantastic. I remember this piece is three hours and 20 minutes long and my first violinist was dashing off afterwards. I said, where are you going? She says, I have a midnight gig. She, so she was playing another concert at midnight in some tavern or something, I don't know. <laughs> Youth, okay. Um, Send, I'm going to send that link that Harold was talking about to all of your emails, um, um, just so you can can view it after this for um, another viewing example. Great. I mean, you know, you can see so many great performances, but I'm I'm kind of proud of the one that we did. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to try to cover at least I don't know maybe half of the choruses. We can't possibly cover everything tonight, but uh, the in the first chorus, you want to get that first chorus up there. She's gonna show a, a vocal score for each score we discuss. And uh, this is the first movement, which is <clears throat> basically in this first movement, the listeners are recruited as mourners and witnesses to take responsibility and to ask for forgiveness. So it's very um, gentle and flowing, very legato, base, you know, basically. Of course, that can change in a moment's notice, but let's, there's a long introduction. As you see, there's 16 measures. And um, I feel, I usually feel like in, in places like this where no matter what volume you're at, there's a, usually a swell in the last measure right before the chorus comes in for, to give some excitement. And of course, Bach and composers of that era <clears throat> didn't put you know, that much in the music, that, mm, that many dynamics, the basics, you know. Of course, you look at a score of Beethoven and he says, andante, ma non troppo, you know, he, he, he keeps uh, 
describing variations of the basic dynamics that these Baroque composers used. Um, once again, um, just like in some of my previous lectures where I talked about being very careful with the opening, <clears throat> you have the great opportunity here of having a, a mighty cake, not just call, but call. You see, hear the difference? Instead of call, but have a, a real nice loud K. Call. And then in rehearsal, what you want to do is make sure that each of the four entering parts, um, apostrophe after the word parts, each of the four entering parts, K, has the same volume. And then it becomes wonderful. It's so even. You know, because if one, if one isn't quite as loud, it really stands out. Um, well, the challenge with this piece, the big challenge is throughout, throughout the whole concert is that um, it's a double chorus and a double orchestra, literally. Um, and then the youth choir, so that it's antiphonal. You have the chorus one on the left, orchestra one on the left, and you have chorus two on the right, orchestra two on the right, two different orchestras completely. So the challenge is, you know, you have to have good hips because you have to swivel a lot. You have to, first you're facing this way and then you're facing this way. You can move your left leg a little bit. You don't have to stand completely still. And there are times when you're working with, a lot of times, and we'll come across some of these, where you're focusing on, let's say the chorus, chorus two and orchestra two is to my right. And then you wanna bring in the children who are to the left. Well, the children, I had them in the center, but let's say you wanna bring in chorus two because it's not always chorus one, then chorus two or chorus two, then chorus one. You know, in other words, it's not always where one part drops out, the other comes in, but you might be working with all four parts of chorus two and then suddenly the sopranos in chorus one come in and you have to, you know, cue them way over to the left while still focusing on, on the cor on chorus two. So it's not the traditional cue, which basically stays within like a strike zone. It's like when I conducted the Verdi Requiem in Carnegie Hall with 69 professional singers, and that was the orchestra of St. Luke's also. I think I discussed this in a previous lecture where, um, you know, the stage was very, um, well, it's Carnegie Hall, beautiful, beautiful acoustics. But the way, oh, I know, what did I say? Verdi Requiem, I did that also, but I'm talking about the Haydn creation now where the strings went way over and I did a lot of, not a lot, but I did some mirror conducting, even, you know, with my arms, like cueing the soprano soloist and then having my left arm completely outstretched and keeping the beat for the violin sake. So you do what you have to do, okay. Um, Anyway, uh, the same principles apply in, in all music. I'll just run a few of them down. Uh, like for example, um, after measure 18, the soprano part, here's, here's measure eight. I'll sing the whole soprano part. See what I did? I came away to G E N. I came away to the F sharp and to give them a breath, I would put a breath there. None of, none of my, my markings or my breath marks obviously are in this score, which was taken from CPDL. But I would have the sopranos breathe after G-E-N and make to make sure that there's a decrescendo mark from the E to the F sharp. Otherwise they're gonna go, I mean, amateurs, like, you know, not such good amateurs, let's say, because there are millions of really, really good amateurs in this world, but the typical college, average college choir might go, uh, again, huh? you know, they might emphasize G-E-M because they're taking a breath and they need to take a very, very quick breath. So that distorts the word clog and that kind of thing. You have to be really careful. And again, for those of you who are new, I always, always, always sing through every single part before I uh, approach the first rehearsal. I mark everything. Uh, with Bach, it's easy and beautiful because there's no wasted note. If I were doing this, you know, with Franz Liszt or Paganini or somebody who like had 20,000 notes where Bach would have had 2,000, it might have got, gotten a little tedious and boring. But with Bach, I, I have a sense, believe it or not, I have a, 
a sense of how every note should be interpreted, every note. And it usually comes to me just about right away. And I, I guess it's, it took years for that to happen. Um, you want to know what the text is, you know, and then you get the feeling. But generally, uh, it sort of sings itself after a while. Um, yeah, so like in measure 22, can we go there down a little bit? I have this general crescendo and I can't really explain it right now. Um, it's not easy to explain in a short amount of time, but in measure 22, I just feel, and all the way through 22 into 23, I feel this expansion. So a crescendo for all voices. So where does that come from? It just comes from feeling it. Let's go to 26 a minute. I wanna talk about how, see the, for the first time chorus two interjects, this whole thing was chorus one and chorus two is on the right. So um, the question is, can you scroll down just a bit so we can see maybe the, yeah, that's good, 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 good. Good, better. Oh, that's even better. Okay, now we have the whole thing. So you have the um, soprano, you have the, fir the first chorus, right, the first chorus. Now, how long do you want to make that fourth soprano note, you know, H-E-T, for all parts? Do you want to make it a full eighth note? I don't think so. Do you want to make the, um, the quarter note in chorus to a full quarter note? I don't think so. I like, if you, if you break those notes, if you make them shorter, then you'll hear the entrances and the exits more. In other words, especially chorus two, they have, you know, a v, the V, W sounds like a V. So it's not, it's not just a vowel, it's a consonant before the vowel, which starts, the consonant obviously starts before the third beat, it's the vowel that's on the third beat. So don't you want to hear the vowel? If you have chorus one, holding that for that eighth note, H-E-T for a full eighth, then the T comes on the third beat and the, v, the W in chorus two will have already started. You see that there's an overlap. I'd rather hear just make v -E -W -E -N as an eighth note. Think about it. It's just something to think about. It's taking a, a big liberty. I don't, usually don't cut note values by 50%, but in this case, I think it's clear that it has to be um, for that reason. Now the children come in, so you have to uh, let's go to uh, 30, 29. So now there's an other layer besides dealing with, yeah, let's scroll down more, a little more, scroll down. Yeah, scroll down to 30 actually with 30s on. Yeah, that's good, 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 stop, stop. Okay, so now you have the children come in, right? And you have chorus one and then you the kids, the kids, um, this is all chorus, and then, oh, they have chorus two, like in measure 34, let's go to 34 for a minute, because here you have everything, 34, there you go. You have the children and chorus two, and it's like a wild scene. It's like the opening of Petrushka, da -da 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 da at the fair, and so much is happening, da -da 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 all these Russian folk tunes. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but there's just so much wonderful stuff happening here that you have to make sure in advance, way before the first rehearsal, that you have enough children who can be heard um, because they should soar above everybody else, I think. They should actually be at least as loud as the composite sound of everybody else. So balance is a big, big, big issue. Okay. Um, let's go way over to uh, measure 57. Fifty seven, yes. So you have a different uh, you have a different text, different you know different uh, motif motif. Ah, where, where, how guilty me. Um, and it's a different like, concept. So, it's been flowing, you know, right before this, you have um, the same music as in the introduction. And then you have, ah, oh, where the altos, for he, 
Oh, here. Now, here's a, um, a spot where you can, in retrospect, you can say after, okay, after figuring out that the soprano and the tenor in chorus two should be breathing in between the same word, right? Fo, fo, hin, fo, hin. Where, where? Unless you want them to sing, fo, hin, fo, hin. I don't see it that way. It's more dramatic, fo, hin. Actual breath, sure, there's plenty of time. But if, you, but if they're breathing, if they're cutting short H-I-N, shouldn't in retrospect the altos who came in before them, who don't necessarily have to breathe uh, before the quarter note is over, but just to be consistent in retrospect, you want to have for him, for him, for him, have unser Schuld. So then um, you have this great drama in chorus two, but chorus one can be have a completely different mood, even a different dynamic. Um, okay, let's go to the second movement and we'll never get out of here. I mean, this I can talk about this for ages. So uh, the next one is the recitative. I mean, the next, you know, short movement before the choral movement. Number two is um, now follow two scenes as chronicle of Jesus' relationship with his disciples who are typically, um, I'm reading my notes here. I haven't seen this in years. Inter interrogative and contentious. The gospel of Matthew is much concerned with Jesus' establishment of community. So it's, when Jesus then had finished with all his these sayings, he said to his disciples, and by the way, oh, just go up a little bit because I'm, just go up before this. Oh, it doesn't have, okay, it doesn't, this version you're looking at doesn't have recitatives, it only has choruses. But um, it's wonderful. Every single time Jesus sings in the St. Matthew Passion, the strings accompany him. And it's a, a you know, it's a, it's a halo effect. It's like a, pictorial device. So anyway, um, let's go to the first chorale because chorales are so interesting in so many, on so many levels. Um, I, the the com, com, Bach doesn't put dynamic markings. So you have to supply it. And keep in mind, oh, I uh, keep in mind that probably in every edition you'll ever see of this, every published edition, you will see formatas in uh, you know over certain notes like in measure six, but I think it's maybe twenty or thirty years ago. Again, I'm not a musicologist, but I know I, you know I've heard I've, I've read that you don't really take fermatas literally in Bach chorales. <clears throat> I think it comes from the tradition where uh, when he composed cantatas for the services, you know they, they were based on the hymn of the day and the final chorale of every cantata, virtually every cantata. Um, was sung by the congregation because they knew it, and you put fermatas to keep them together. So they, you know, they would sort of, if they were a little ahead, they would stop. They knew when to really listen. So, but there are some fermatas I take. <clears throat> Most I don't, but some I do. Um, and you have to come up with a, a dynamic. Now, does the does the dynamic you start with have to be the one you end with? No, there's no, there are no rules. Um, and uh, so they come in on the fourth beat. So you give the third beat, you give the third beat and they come in on the fourth beat. I have Forte marked here. Ah, Jesus. Um, ah, Jesus, uh, dear, what precept? It's hard for me to see. I'm getting laser surgery in two weeks on top of my already cataract surgery. So I'll be seeing a little better. Um, it's painless and 30 seconds long. Um, thou, what precept hast thou broken? That's such a cruel judgment has been spoken. So I have Forte here. It's pretty intense, you know. In my score, which is a uh, Baron writer, which is really a very um, a scholarly score, it does have a it does have a fermata on uh, in the third measure. But I mean, you don't take it, but it's written here. So I cross it out and I put a, um, a check mark. Um, you know, in every, in, in virtually every phrase in, in, in all of music, I try to discover the uh, peaks and the valleys. I mean, mainly the peaks. What, what syllable 
would be the loudest one when this whole thing would, would be spoken. Hetz liebst du Jesu, was hast du verbrochen? Right? So B-R-O is the loudest. It happens to be the, la- the, the highest note, but that's beside the point because often it isn't. So I would mark in a crescendo from V-E-R to B-R-O, and I would definitely put a decrescendo into C-H-E-N, the breath mark. Uh, but there is one spot. In fact, let's, let's go on. Let's go on. Uh, I'll sing it when I get to the end. Scroll down. I'll continue. Well, here's an example where you really want to have either a crescendo from G-E to S-P-R-O or an accent on S-P-R-O because none of the four parts goes up in pitch from G-E to S-P-R-O. So the tendency would be to go to, to relax in volume and not stress the stressed syllable, which I think is a big mistake, obviously. Um, but keep going. Notice I took no breath there. I took no breath. Why? I can't answer that. I just feel it. It's it's like um, you're discovering. Everyone is different. You're discovering, and it just seems to me it would be so beautiful to sing. Thou um, was für mich getan. It's of wait. Was ist die Schuld of what misdeed has thou to make confession of what transgression? I mean, you can easily take a breath, but and maybe even sing it softer, more contemplatively. It's just beautiful molding of things. Okay, let's go to the next chorus. Um, So I'm not gonna mention names, but I work with a wonderful uh, continual player, a portative organist and in this particular concert, I think it was this one, yeah. He would rather that, oh, it's not, he would rather that when going from a chorus to an aria, I didn't, no, going from a chorus to a recitative, right. So go back, go back to the chorale a minute, the ending of the chorale. Okay, stop, stop. So in between the ending of the chorale and the next movement, there's a, a short recitative, and he would have preferred that I didn't cut the chorus off, that I did not start the recitative. And I didn't have to. I mean, you don't, and you certainly don't conduct recitatives unless they're accompaniado, you know, with strings or whatever. Um, but I just wanted to set the pace. So we had a little, you know, tug of war there, but the conductor always should win out uh, nicely. You know, you don't, it wasn't an argument, it was just, um, I wanted him to, and, uh, and then you get the downbeat and you disappear because it's a vegetative. Um, now, going from, you, you don't see this, but the ending of the vegetative is, um, well, let me give it some of the, let me, let me give you all the words. Then assemble the elders with the scribes and the chief priests also, and together came they all within the palace of the high priest he whose name was Caiaphas and counseled there how Jesus by craft should be taken and put to death. But thus they said, sie sprachen aber boom, boom, dominant tonic. And then you have this ataka. Just go down a little bit. These are the elders, the scribes, and the chief priests plotting about taking Jesus. So it's marcato. But my point is, Going from the recitative, it's important for a conductor to know exactly when he or she wants to cue to start to start re-engaging with the players. So there are five notes before um, before the final dominant tonic by the continuo. I would conduct the downbeat, even though. It's a recitative, you don't conduct it. There's a lot of freedom. So before this, 
Und dann, da, da. Sie sprachen aber dann, bom, bam, ja, dum, 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 dum. So in this particular case, I would conduct the last measure and tell the and, and tell the the evangelist beforehand that I am going to set the tempo and that he should do the last few notes in my tempo and not just sie sprachen aber dum, da, da, which which a conductor has the right. You know, the, if the conductor wants to lay low until the chorus comes in, that's one thing. But I like to con uh, connect the moods. Like, no, I like to establish the new mood, even though the last few notes of the previous section are still s spinning out. And it seems to work very, very well. So he's singing. I'm not doing anything. Then. And then, da, dun, 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 da, dun, 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 dun. so that's important. Carol, uh, yeah. I have a question. It's Elise. Um, yeah. So I've never conducted like a Baroque piece of music with an orchestra, obviously. So why, how does the orchestra stay together with the singer when they're singing the rest of the recitative? Good question. But they don't. Oh. Because the recitative is only the basso continuo. It's oh, okay. the organ and the cello, or harpsichord and cello, or you know, or, or, or organ, cello, and double bass, and they're they're so trained, you know. You, it's wonderful to watch a cellist sitting right next to the keyboard and peripherally watching the body motion of the of the keyboard player. Yeah. Now, in 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 uh, recitative accompagnato, which is much less frequent, like in Messiah, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. And that's the whole orchestra. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway. Right? So that's a compagnata. There you have to conduct. Okay. But here you don't you don't conduct. They'll get very angry if you conduct. I, don't, okay. I wouldn't blame them. <laughs> I mean that's I, I wouldn't bit. I told you that story. I'm not going to mention names, but uh, one of my professional singers and well, my, I mean, look, the best professional singers, they're in all the groups, you know, all the professional groups, they're ringers. But one of them was walking down the street. I met her and she was really angry and she just came for a rehearsal from a rehearsal. And she was like venting to me. She said, I was doing a recitative freely and the conductor got mad. He says, it's a recitative, it's strict time. <laughs> oh, boy. oh boy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the very end of the movement. The very end of the, the last measure, the last two measures, right? <laughs> I'm sticking the soprano part. <laughs> Notice I slowed down. You don't want to plow ahead. It's very rare that you plow ahead until the last note without a ritardando or at least a rubato. Uh, <laughs> Let me see what this I can see. Okay. Dun 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 You can even subdivide. Dun 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 dun. I think there's a mistake in the score there. Yeah, that last note should be a quarter note. Yeah, that's a mistake. See, CPDL is full of mistakes. Right? I think there's a CPDL. Maybe it's IMSLP. I don't know. What is this, Karina? This is CPDL that you sent on the yeah the, the links that you sent. Extraordinarily valuable, but you know anybody in the world can anybody can submit an edition. And this has this has three and a half beats in it. The last measure, right? So it's the folk is a full quarter, and you, sometimes you want to milk it. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, you want to milk that last note, and then you you bring in the rich motif starts. Okay, next movement. Next, uh, the disciples have indignation at Jesus wasting expensive ointment. You know, when he, um, he went to Bethany and there was a woman and she brought him a box of the costliest ointment and poured it on his head. So they were mad at him. And once again, there's a, um, a recitative leading into it. And then I start conducting on the second beat of the preceding measure. So he goes, 
da da seine Junge sungen. Dun, 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 dun. And I even have a, 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 a cello rondo. I go, dun, 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 dun. isn't that something? You, a, a cello rondo leading into this, into this movement. That's really exciting. Would Bach have done that? You know, I, I'd like to think that there's nothing that I, um, that I do that would disappoint or make a composer upset. And look, listen to anybody, any of the greats performing Bach. Listen to Murray Pariah playing Bach on the piano, you know, Bach harpsichord pieces on the piano. Listen to, um, you know, Daniel Trifonov. Listen to um, Cesar Ozawa conducting the St. Matthew. I mean, th there's expression in every note. You don't want, it's, there's not, composers can't put everything in they can't put every single thing in the music. That's crazy. There'll be nothing to interpret. One, two. Dun, 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 dun. So I have um, an accent on the second measure on UN and a staccato on lot. And I put marcato at the beginning. I put allegro, marcato, forte. Allegro, marcato, forte. So one, two. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, pew, pew forte, one second. Um, okay, hold on a second. Yeah, you can take this. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, a lot of interpreting. I had PIU in measure 24, you know, louder. Um, and then in 26, Oh, you have different uh, measure numbers. Aha. So my, my, um, your first measure is measure 26 and measure 23 in my score. Anyway, so go to your fourth measure, your fifth measure. Your fifth measure. Yeah. Unrat. Again, I have Unrat. Now the tenors have to breathe, obviously. So, if they have to breathe, why wouldn't you have the other three parts staccato? You have to. You don't want the other parts, the soprano, alto, and bass, as a full eighth note. That's silly. And then, first of all, there'll be no third of the chord for a brief moment, but that's not the point. Uh, I think the point is that Bach expected everybody to cut off together there. Um, and this whole thing is marcato. Can we go um, to measure 29? Oh, so let's go ahead. Wait, you have a different <clears throat> edition. So one second. I want the last five measures. There you are. It's a short movement. The last five measures. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, yeah, it's all forte, it's all forte. And then we have um, the fourth to the last measure, right, Verdin. I have them coming down to a mezzo piano. Now, right before this measure, it's dun, 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 and then Verdin come away dramatically and then contrast um, that with a forte on den, den Armen. And actually the basses come away from there to then and they have immediate forte Jesus in the bass. So there's a lot of variety. And then at the very end, um, the um, the very last measure, you know, there's a poco writ and you have to, you might want to subdivide if it's a little more than poco writ for the alto sake. So here are the last two measures. Da dun 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 da dun 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 da 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 dun dun da. You might want to subdivide for the altos. One, two, and three. You know, and if there's a fermata on there, but it's it's meaningless. I mean, you you hold it. Well, it's it's not really meaningless, uh, but but you know, a fermata implies more than you hold it more than the actual note value. But within a retard. You know, you might just think of it as a half note stretched out a bit. So as opposed to a fermata, it doesn't matter. Okay, then there's an ataka again. And then um, 
there were two retro keys in a row. And then, by the way, let me just, uh, yeah, while you're setting up the next chorus. Oh, you're there already. Okay. Um, when I conduct, um, you know, it's the, <laughs> There's nothing, there's nothing better, right? Nothing better for me than being on stage and conducting. Um, but sometimes I get really nervous. Um, like I'm halfway through, I'm three quarters of, I'm thinking in my head, I'm thinking, okay, come on, you can do it. <laughs> this is really tough. I hope, I wish, sometimes I wish it were over. I do, I said, I, I wish it were over. I wish I was taking my final bow and just going, you know, because it's so intense. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure every one of you who has performed has had similar feelings. It's, you know, it's nerve wracking to perform. What if it doesn't go right? Well, in my lifetime, I must say that maybe a hundred times, maybe more in my life with school choirs and even uh, most of my non-professional non choirs, I've had to jump in and sing alto part, soprano part, tenor part, bass part at times, just because they missed the entrance. With choruses and soloists. By the way, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but sometimes you assess the soloists and you, feel, you realize that there are um, some are better musicians than other. And if you have the option, you might want to put the person who might need, let's put it nicely, who might need a little more guidance from you, closest to you. So you can lean in and, uh, you know, give a little more help or bop them over their head with your baton if they make a mistake, I'm only kidding. Okay, now, vo, vo. Um, so I have here, uh, leading up to this is a recitative. Now on that day, the first of unleavened bread came the disciples to Jesus and said to him, where, where, where wilt thou, Lord? Where wilt thou, Lord, that we shall all eat the Passover together? So I have it starting with um, mezzo forte. The second one, mezzo forte plus. Yeah, you can have something in between mezzo forte and mezzo and forte. Brahms would do things like that um, and other com composers. You can put mezzo forte slash forte or just mezzo forte plus. And the third measure is, is forte. Um, you know, keeping in mind that everything should be shaped, everything, no matter if it's vivace, fortissimo, or pianissimo, adagio, everything has shape. Um, I heard a performance, a virtual performance recently of a piece, I won't mention the name of the group or the name of the piece, but the notes were there, the beauty, the beauty of the voices were there, but there was very little shape and it was boring. Uh, even in uh, Tomas Kircher in Leipzig, when I heard two performances and, and one of them was sublime and the other was boring. I, I don't think the, frankly, the conductor took much time to, you know, to sing through the inner parts and figure out things. So, um, here's an interesting example. The first time we're seeing this, look at the very last few measures a second. So the words are, where will thou, I, I read the words, uh, where will thou all eat the Passover, the Passover together. Um, but look what I'm doing. See where you can see that I'm doing that I haven't done yet or talked about. I'm gonna start from <clears throat> measure eight. I'll sing the soprano part again. Off. There was no retard. I just didn't feel like there should be a retard there. In fact, I made I made staccatos there. And a very gentle last one. Beautiful. No retard, I just don't feel it. Um, sort of like at the very end of many masterworks where you retard, but you don't come away in volume to the last note because 
it's just different. It's a very special moment. So you, you, you gotta think through everything. Let's look at the next chorus. So we're about three quarters of the way through this discussion and I'm only up to page 47 in my score, which has 299 pages, but I never thought I'd get to the whole thing anyway. I did say in my description that we're doing choruses from one and two. So let me do one more from part one or two more, and then I'll skip to something in part two. Maybe the last movement, yes. Um, I think the last movement of the St. John Passion is better than the last movement here, but when you're talking which is, which you'd rather have gold or diamonds, it's hard to know the difference. Would the you Saint want to go to that now, Harold? Watch that. Do you want me to go to the last movement now? No, I want to talk about um, this one first. Okay. Hey, the one you're on. Um, so the words leading into it, then were they exceedingly grieved and they began to question him, everyone and to say unto him, hey, not I, you know, is it I, who's gonna, who's going to betray you, right? Hey. So and actually, hey. I used to have much better high notes. I heard a cantata yesterday, I, my, my eight-year-old grandson, I turned him on to cantata 51, uh, Yauxet by Bach, right? Soprano solo cantata with a high C. She hits a high C a few times. And I remember doing it um, 22 years ago with a male soprano. I forget his name, Robert something. And he had the high C's beautifully. Okay, anyway, that was extraordinary. Um, yeah, so and so I have this, is it I, is it I? But then in the fourth measure, hair bin ish, hair bin smish, you know, a big crescendo with drama at the end. And then it goes right into the chorale, mezzo forte. It starts mezzo forte and then it gets to be, it starts mezzo forte, it goes to forte, it goes to mezzo forte. But look at the very end of the chorale. Let's go to the chorale, the next movement. Yeah, just go to the last measure. I want to show you the last measure of this movement. Look at the tenors. They have three notes on the second beat and everybody else has one note. And if you're slowing down a lot, obviously you have to subdivide, right? How much do you subdivide? I mean, if, if it's this slow, I'm going to sing the tenor part starting from after the, from Mata in measure 10. You know, it's it's enough to subdivide just the second beat, just give two and. But if you have, you know, amateur singers and they're having a little trouble, and if you want to slow down even more, you might want to subdivide the subdivision like this. Give them each note. It's not unheard of. Subdividing the subdivision is, is legit. Let's go to the very last movement of the piece. Harold, I think we have a question from Maria, I think. Okay. Maria, if you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. Can I see Maria or not? Maybe, maybe not. There she is. Press show grid. Bar. Should I, what should I press on? Show grid video or yeah, uh, nothing? Gallery view. Maria, go ahead. Can we hear you? I'm not hearing. Oh, she's talking to you. Hmm. I can't hear her. Let me let me chat with her to um to oh. that, and then you go on and I'll and I'll work with her. Okay. So the very last movement of the second part. This is the, it's actually yeah, it's part two. Yeah. Very long. The very last uh, movement, I should say, not the not the last measure. Um, it's at the grave we weep. Rest well. Well, uh, what I was going to say was. To me, uh, it's not important, but to me, root vol um, from the St. John Passion 
is, is a better, more moving movement than this last movement, but that's, who cares? I mean, that's just me. This is quite appropriate. Let's talk about tempo for a minute, just generally speaking. Um, it can make all the difference. You know, like in this pandemic, I've been listening to a lot of music and different performances, different interpretations of many different pieces. But um, I must have heard five different openings of Zing It Den Hand by Bach the Motet. Zing, dun, 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 before I came upon a tempo that didn't drive me nuts. Uh, I felt it was too fast, they, they were too fast and too boisterous. I mean, look, every one of the performances was incredible, but um, you gotta take your time. Even when you're conducting like 68 movements, this piece has 68 movements and you have to, you have to know the tempi ahead of time of, for each one. That's a tall order. It takes months of study and, and restudying and thinking all the time. So expansive. Even a slower. You know, if it's if it's ten metronome markings faster, then it, it just seems wrong to me, at least. It's just very important. Um, so, um, look at the very opening. Now, where are we? This is the. Ah, I see. The introduction, the orchestral introduction has the same motif. It's da, 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 flute, flutes, oboes, violins. You might, you might think this should be a, a, a breath. Well, let's look at the choral part, which imitates the orchestral opening. Um, you know, I can see if this were purely orchestral and you were the concert master, concert mistress, wouldn't you entertain the notion that there'd be, since the, the, bow, the bow changes direction, so it's sort of like a, a, a collective breath after uns. You know, it's obvious to me that in many cases, if there were no words, you might all take a little break there. But the words are here. I mean, my English translation is translation and this score is not accurate, but obviously any measure that begins with MIT <laughs> with, you know, you'd think it should be connected. We, I guess that means uh, we sit, we sit with uh, weeping, deep weeping, something like that. So it's one idea. You don't want to take a breath there is the point. You have to go with the words. Um, yeah. Um, before the before measure twenty, well, you have you have measure numbers. Uh, yeah, before twenty, I think your measure markings are different from mine. Let me just see something. What does your measure start? What measure does your start on for this movement? The chorus comes in first in measure thirteen. Yeah, yeah, it's, the same. it's right. Let me get rid of the images here. How do I do that? Because um, it's covering the music. Ah, there we go. Okay. Okay, let's just talk Turkey a little bit. Let's talk, uh, you know, some 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 detail of some of the what some of the lines should be doing. For example, in measure sixteen, it seems to me the tenor should breathe after, you know, train train in what is that? M E D E R M E D. They can take a breath there. So um, you, you just have to be alert that they don't go like accent the D because they're taking a very, very, very quick breath. Should the, um, what length breath should the bass and soprano take? Again, I think you want to not cut notes in half if you if you can help it. In other words, the basses and soprano should not take a quarter breath, but simply an eighth breath. It's not that fast. They can do that. And the tenors, I mean, the altos um, cut off on the downbeat. They breathe on the downbeat of measure 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So you want to 
if you have the opportunity of marking up all the parts, for example, before you hand them out, you can cross out the eighth breath alto note in 17 and just put a check instead. Um, yeah, measure 20. So scroll down. Scroll down to 20. That's it. Okay. So here's a spot where you don't want all four parts to breathe at the same time. The upper three have to, but the bases take an eighth breath and they come in on ru or you before the others do. You just have to pay attention to each line. Um, here's a difficult thing to do for the um, soprano, for the all four parts in measure 21, 22, 22, to take a quick breath and jump up an octave, almost an octave sopranos, for example, up to a high A flat on an oo. It's hard to do. That takes a lot of work. Um, now here's, a, here's a, a, an example, something a little different from what I said in measure 20, where the basses breathe before everybody else. Here, um, in measure, in chorus two and measure 22, between, between ru and ruha, obviously the upper three parts have to breathe. Should the basses breathe with them or simply make it an eighth breath? That's up to you. There are two schools of thought on that. In other words, the upper three parts really have to take extraordinarily quick breaths. So should the basses try to go or just, or just simply off. I mean, I think it's easy for the basses to take an eighth breath and you don't really need them there. And will the audience really hear them if they linger and cut off with the other three parts? I don't, I don't think so. So I think it's okay to give them an eighth breath. Um, anyway, the court, the concert, I mean, let's skip to the very, very, very end. The last few measures of the piece. You know, it just ends so beautifully, softly. No great drama. Sweetly sleep. Sweetly sleep. And there's no great drama. So even though, even if the, um, even though, and even if the last statement is forte or mezzo forte, like starting on a ruha, like the soprano in chorus one, in measure 20, 126. Soft, soft, soft. And maybe a retard and maybe not, you know, maybe a retard or maybe no retard but a decrescendo or both. It's just a beautiful, simple ending. And it's three hours with one, with one break. It's, it can easily be three hours and 20 minutes, which I think it was when I did this. So that's it. Any questions? Maria, did you have a question? No, I was having some tech difficulties before. I lost the sound. Oh. Yeah, got it. I yeah, I had to work on that. <laughs> it's all right. I mean, basically, I had I had to leave and then come back. I mean, I didn't know how else to do it. How strange. Well, we're hearing you now, so that's good. Yeah. No, but I mean, I couldn't hear, you know, I couldn't hear Harold. I mean, it was really oh. quite frustrating there for a bit. And you, when you came back, did you, were you able to hear him? Yeah, fine. Okay. The solution, these are archived. Yeah, exactly. Right. I know, thank you. You're welcome. Edition you recommend? Which edition? Mm. Well, uh, singing. I can certainly recommend the Baron Rider. Baron Rider. You know, better than Calmness. I mean, I remember doing Handel's Samson, the oratorio. I think it was that. I mean, I did a whole bunch of them. And I sent away for the full score when I was young. I, I, uh, uh, Calmus, based in Florida. Say no more. They, have, they must have had an alligator walk through their office. They did something really weird. They sent me an edition 
of Handel's Oratory of Samson with trombones. And they, they were added instruments. Some of them weren't even invented in his day. And I opened the full score, which cost $90 in the early 80s. It cost $90 and I opened the full score and the binding fell apart. So be careful with Kalamissa. <laughs> and uh, no, but Baron Rider is a great addition. It's the, it's the or text, which means what? It means it's, the, it's from the Black Gesellschaft, complete works. It's most authoritative. I think, right, Dom, you were shaking your head. I, what do I know? I'm not a musicologist, but I think that's right. Oh, try again, Don. We can't hear you. Yeah, Don. Un unmute you. That, you keep muting and unmuting yourself. Now you're muted, Tom. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, when you have your choirs, uh, especially with two choirs, you're going to have your ringers or your stronger section leaders. Where do you uh, like to place them? Good point. Because in this piece, it's very rare this happens, but obviously there are four soloists, you know, who have a lot to sing. But then I think there are four people who emerge from the chorus singing just a few notes, like one measure or two measures here and there. I don't necessarily think they have to be in the first row at all. I mean, if you think of it, um, sometimes if you're on the top riser, you're heard better. It depends on the hole you're in. Uh, sometimes you want these, obviously these are the better singers and the stronger voices, so you might want them uh, placed behind some of the softer voices or some of the weaker singers so they can influence them. This brings up an issue of, you know, of if you're using, if you're mixing professionals and amateurs, where to put the professionals. Now in the 1980s and 90s, I was asked eight times, I was asked eight times to put together um, a huge chorus, but there wasn't much budget as opposed to when I was hired by the, the, the Bard Festival three times to supply 120 professional singers. And for one concert, it cost the Bard Festival $96,000 for the singers. Um, but I worked with uh, Leon, Leon Botstein uh, and Charles McCarris and Bob Spano in doing about eight concerts, I think it was, where they wanted a <clears throat> um, a mixture. So I had, I expanded Canticum Novum. Many times I added other choirs of mine, my university choirs, but I had ringers. So I had usually about 80 amateurs and 20 or 30 professionals. And the question is, where do you put the professionals? Do you put them in the back row because everybody will hear them? Or do you put them in, you know, spread out, just evenly spaced throughout? Do you put them in little clusters? I hate using the word cluster now during the pandemic, but you know, it just, it depends. I mean, I, want, I remember doing once uh, at BAM, I did host uh, planets. And for whatever reason, I put eight or 10, all eight or 10 professionals I hired in addition to the amateur singers in one row. Uh, I knew that the hall was able to mic them. They can put mics above them um, because it needed some uh, amplification. Uh, not very often do you do that, but sometimes amplification, you can't even hear. You can't even hear that it's, it's electronic. So they were amplified. It's just to, a long answer to a short question. It, it depends on all those things. Thank you. You're welcome. Sheila, Sheila are you raising your finger or just scratching your cheek? <laughs> she, if for those of you who don't know Sheila Schoenbrun, she, well, Celeste knows and I know she was a leader in the early music field and one of the great sopranos of our time in the early music field. So thank you, Sheila, for giving us your wonderful voice and musicianship and your presence. Um, yeah, any, wow. any other questions? A question regarding um... I don't know how I got this score at home, but I got it in English and it's G. Schirmer. Yeah, I know. I have that too. You have this too? 
Yeah, I use it as a paperweight. I don't you really open it up or anything. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's, well, yeah. It's totally different because as soon as translation, like it's instead of one eight note, you have to 16 and so on and so on. I know. And, well, and, even, even, yeah, even beyond that, we talked about this briefly last week, I think it was. I just can't imagine doing Bach in English. Mm. I just can't. <laughs> May I ask you, Shayla, did you sing my song cycle back, back in the 19th? I think so. The Shayla before well, she... my song cycle somewhere when I just arrived in the US, maybe it was like 95. Yeah. She doesn't remember me, maybe. Or maybe it does. I don't hear you. Well, Sheila, Sheila's mute. You're muted, Sheila. CUNY grad school in, in the, on Fifth Avenue back then. Well, you can email each other. <laughs> I, I don't anything see email right now, but uh, Karina maybe give me if if you have. Yeah. Oh, look at that! Now you're unmuted, Sheila. You want to respond? She wants to know if you performed yeah. any of her music. I think she. She did. thinks you. I think I did, but uh, with continuum. No, I think it was my my accompaniment, piano accompaniment, and your solo, and it was like ninety five. And, and she wants to know if she wants to know if you I did don't it. Don't remember. Yeah, I do. Yeah, she, she, I'm sorry. I don't remember so many important things. I remember a lot of trivia, <laughs> and I remember the parties after the concerts, but <laughs> no. not the concerts very much. Let's have a party here. I have my champagne. Virtual party. <laughs> oh, good. Party. Oh, well, there you go. Martinelli. <laughs> no. Yeah, can, okay. she mentioned um, uh, Allah. She mentioned Continuum. She, that's Joel Sachs and Cheryl Seltzer. Right. That, it was what not, a great organization. It was I all, didn't, uh, uh, all location of uh, Great Center of City University of New York. It was on Fifth Avenue, and Shella did my cycle to the poem, a poem by Bunin, and she did it in Russian. Okay, nice. Cool. I was Very nice. And was Any last questions time. before we, I know we went a little bit over today. Um, thank you all that could stay with us. Some people told me that they had to leave, um, but um, any, any last questions for Harold? Again, you can always email him if you think later um, or think of something. Um, um, something else? I ask you also, Harold, when you perform, like let's say you use Baden Reiter edition, so, um, and you order orchestral parts from them too, am I right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, God, yeah. You have to match. You can't have parts from one publisher and full, and full score from another. Yeah. That would be pretty disastrous. <laughs> Just a quick story. I remember doing a premiere by Berio. I did two premieres by Berio. And I rented the I rented the music from a European American and they were big scores. You know, really big scores. And they didn't they didn't have vocal scores. They just had the orchestral score for everybody. And it was handwritten. It was it wasn't uh, you know engraved. So I spent four and a half hours, I remember this, about four and a half, five hours or more in every part, making clear what the notes really were because it was mm. slow handwriting. And still in my professional choir rehearsal, there were questions, what is this note? What is the, they couldn't read it. We wasted so much time. I refused to pay. I didn't prepay. I refused to pay for the scores because it wasted like, I'm paying the singers to ask me questions. What, what note is this? So, Thank God, you know, with these publishing companies, you don't get the same people staying year after year. So like three years later, they had no idea I stiffed them because nobody was there. <laughs> but I had a right to, they, I lost so much, you know, time. And then I thanked Barry, I called him, he was in Boston. One time I thanked him. I, oh, I asked him a question about the score and I thanked him. Thank you for all the service, all your great music. And he went, Ugh. and he hung up. <laughs> okay. Right. That's another story about him and his uh, friends and in his country. That's another story. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.
joining us today and we'll see you next week. Don't forget to sign up and tell your friends, tell your peers, anyone you think will be interested, send them our way, send them the link and um, we'll see you on next week. What am I doing? Do you remember? <laughs> I'll remember. Well, I don't, Good night. I don't have anything else to do here. Good night all. I'm in an assisted living home. So oh. it's, it's care and we're on lockdown because yeah. of the COVID thing. So it's just like being in prison. I know, but it was an honor for me to see you. And I hope you I'm, can join me. And I, you, it's, uh, that's, why I came, that's why I came here. Not Thank here, you. but here. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila. To everybody, good night then. Good night. Good night. Good night.